Okay. Thanks again, Dr. Goldenberg. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm speaking this morning about the uh, contemporary role of renal mass biopsy and the expanding rationale for its use. Uh, to outline the talk, I'll start by reviewing pertinent background information and then discuss the indications and contraindications of renal mass biopsy. I'll go over some uh, technical considerations of the procedure, uh, and then I'll discuss the complications and limitations, as well as its uh, diagnostic yield and accuracy. Uh, I'll then move on to discuss the impact of biopsy on making treatment decisions, including its use in active surveillance, its use for the selection of targeted therapy and metastatic disease, and I'll finish up by discussing the importance of uh, renal biopsy and the molecular and genetic characterization of renal tumors. Uh, so the incidence of uh, renal tumors has been steadily increasing over the last several decades. This is due in large part to the increase in detection of incidental small renal masses with the widespread use of abdominal imaging. Uh, overall, the majority of large renal masses can be diagnosed accurately by radiological imaging alone, but in certain circumstances, some renal masses, particularly if uh, small, asymptomatic, and incidentally discovered, uh, can be difficult to characterize using imaging alone. Uh, the dilemma presented by small renal masses is that they are a heterogeneous group of both benign and malignant entities with varying clinical behaviors, and the proportion of small renal masses that are benign is significant. Uh, a multicenter series from 2004 of uh, 771 partial nephrectomies on small renal masses showed 28% uh, were benign on final pathology, while a series looking at open and partial nephrectomy specimens from 1970 to 2000 at the Mayo Clinic showed 30% of tumors less than 4 centimeters were benign. Uh, when stratifying uh, small masses further, a study by uh, Frank et al. Uh, from 2003 demonstrated that uh, Masses less than 2 centimeters are benign 30% of the time, while tumors uh, 2 to 4 centimeters in size are benign in 21% of cases. Uh, in addition, young female patients have a two-fold increased likelihood of having a benign small renal mass. And uh, in terms of the clinical behavior of small renal masses, uh, a meta-analysis of over 300 small renal masses observed for three years demonstrated an average growth rate of 0 0.28 centimeters per year, uh, with only four reported cases of metastasis during follow-up. Uh, considering the significant proportion of these masses that are benign, uh, this leads us to how much we can rely on imaging alone to determine if masses are malignant or not. Uh, the assessment of tumor malignancy generally relies on tumor size, shape, profile, and tissue enhancement on triphasic CT or MRI. However, even with modern imaging techniques, it can be difficult to predict the aggressiveness of small renal tumors or to accurately identify some benign lesions such as oncocytoma and FAT4 AMLs. Uh, in a retrospective analysis from 2007 of over 500 patients treated surgically, uh, Remzi et al. showed that only 17% uh, of all benign renal masses were correctly defined on pre-op CT, and 43% uh, of patients with benign final pathology were treated with radical nephrectomy. Uh, similarly, another study from Frank et al. in 2003 reported 65% of 376 benign renal lesions were treated with radical nephrectomy. Uh, this demonstrates a significant proportion of patients who are potentially being overtreated and suggests that even modern imaging techniques uh, are imperfect and should not be relied upon solely when evaluating small renal masses. Uh, however, I should mention that there are emerging radiologic techniques which uh, hold uh, promise in improving the diagnostic accuracy for small renal masses, uh, and they include uh, contrast enhanced uh, or microbubble micro ultrasound and uh, fusion techniques such as uh, PET-CT, PET-MRI, and immuno-PET scans. Uh, when we consider the management of small renal masses, uh, although we know the standard of care is nephron sparing surgery when feasible, uh, alternative treatment modalities are possible in carefully selected patients with shorter life expectancies and significant comorbidities, uh, including ablative treatments and active surveillance. Uh, the decision of the best treatment modality is based on uh, multiple patient factors and tumor characteristics. Uh, the idea of uh, risk stratifying tumors in patients and using this as a rationale for choosing the most uh, appropriate treatment option means that we should explore other ways to improve our uh, diagnostic accuracy. And um, this brings us to the use of renal mass biopsy. Um, when we look back at the traditional established indications for biopsy, uh, we see that it's been used to identify suspected renal abscesses and to differentiate renal cell carcinoma from lymphoma or a metastatic disease to the kidneys in the presence of known extra-renal malignancy. Uh, and finally, it's been used to confirm the diagnosis of a primary renal tumor with uh, metastases when the primary tumor is not 
amenable to uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy. Uh, the rationale for performing biopsy with these indications was that the treatment in these scenarios was uh, primarily non-surgical. Beyond these indications, uh, renal mass biopsy was traditionally not advocated uh, over concerns about its safety, diagnostic yield, and accuracy, as well as the limited ability of uh, biopsy to influence treatment decisions. Uh, based on the perception that uh, all small, uh, solid small renal masses have malignant potential and should be removed with surgery up front. Uh, until recently, this perception was made stronger by the absence of uh, effective systemic salvage therapy for metastatic disease. Uh, the interest in an expanding role of renal mass biopsy is in cases where it can change management of a renal tumor. Uh, the indications uh, listed on this slide here come from a 2012 review from uh, European Urology. Uh, I've highlighted some of the non-traditional indications, including uh, the use of biopsy for uh, incidentally diagnosed small renal masses and candidates for active surveillance or ablative therapy, for the follow-up of tumors treated with thermal ablation to confirm histologic success and to monitor for recurrence, for small renal masses that are indeterminate on imaging, including selected indeterminate cystic lesions, and for uh, metastatic renal tumors to help select the optimal systemic therapy, especially when cytoreductive nephrectomy is not indicated, or when planning to use neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, as we get further along, I'll explain the rationale for performing biopsies in these scenarios. But um, before we press on, I'll go over the uh, contraindications. Uh, in bold are the contraindications from that same uh, European review that listed the indications on the previous slide. Uh, the sole recognized absolute contraindication would be an uncorrected coagulopathy, while uh, relative contraindications would be patients with limited life expectancy or patients with locally advanced or disseminated uh, metastatic disease who are not candidates for surgical, ablative, or medical <coughs> therapy. However, other offers have listed uh, other potential contraindications, including solitary kidney, morbid obesity, pregnancy, and uncontrolled hypertension. Um, let's change gears again and um, touch on some of the technical aspects of performing renal mass biopsy. Uh, in general, uh, renal mass biopsy can be performed on an outpatient basis, including here at BGH. Uh, the literature typically recommends pre-procedure blood work, particularly focused on ruling out coagulopathy to ensure an INR of less than one and a half, although some centers allow an INR as high as two. Uh, similarly, a platelet count of at least 50 is typically recommended, but some accept a count as low as uh, 25. Uh, the biopsies can be performed under conscious sedation or local anesthetic. Uh, when it comes to positioning, uh, the patient can be placed either prone or in uh, lateral decubitus with the ipsilateral side down uh, to splint the motion of the kidney during respiration. Uh, the needle is inserted from a posterior approach in a trajectory that avoids the lungs, adjacent organs, uh, and central collecting system. Uh, for performing the biopsy itself, the options are for uh, fine needle aspiration or core samples. Uh, when compared to fine needle aspiration, a core sample is more likely to be diagnostic and has the advantage of uh, providing histology rather than just cytology. Uh, FNA can be useful for aspirating cystic masses and may provide greater cytologic detail compared to core samples, but uh, in this era, often a cannula can be placed into the tumor and then both FNA and core biopsies uh, can be taken through the same access. Uh, with regard to tumor sampling, the optimal number of cores that should be taken and the optimal biopsy pattern that should be used has not been clearly defined and uh, does require further research. Although uh, no clinical practice guidelines are available, there is agreement that at least uh, two good quality cores should be obtained uh, in each case, and at least 10 millimeter cores are required for reliable analysis. Uh, there are indications that a larger needle size produces better diagnostic outcomes, but with a uh, larger needle size comes a potential for the increased risk of uh, bleeding. Uh, an 18 gauge needle is now considered the current standard, allowing for sufficient tissue for diagnostic accuracy with appropriate safety. Uh, biopsies of the peripheral part of the tumor are sometimes recommended in larger lesions to avoid central necrosis, uh, while both central and peripheral sampling is often recommended for small renal masses. However, uh, uh, a sampling of the entire lesion may be useful for tumors of any size uh, because the diagnosis, do, diagnosis of uh, intratumoral necrosis does have uh, prognostic significance. Um, let's move on now to compare uh, ultrasound and CT guided procedures. Um, Although studies have shown that ultrasound guidance is superior to blinded non-focal renal biopsies, uh, searching the literature, I found no study that uh, directly compared CT-guided biopsies with ultrasound-guided biopsies. 
Um, ultrasound has the advantage of uh, real-time needle placement and has no radiation and is therefore uh, well suited for most non-focal renal biopsies in thin patients and it biopsies of some focal solid masses or cystic masses that are well visualized on ultrasound. Uh, CT has the advantage of better resolution and tissue contrast and is better able to localize lesions uh, and is better for identifying surrounding uh, critical structures as well. Uh, cystic renal lesions uh, represent a special subset of uh, renal mass biopsy. Uh, the primary goal in biopsying a cystic lesion is to sample any solid component of the cyst. Uh, if the solid component is not well identified, then any portion of the cyst can be targeted. Uh, the fluid is an aspirated and air or contrast uh, material injected to identify the solid component, um, as can be seen on the images here. Uh, on the image on the left, the cyst is being uh, aspirated, and on the right, with the installation of contrast, uh, a solid component can be appreciated where the arrow is pointing. Uh, the fluid can then be sent for cytology evaluation, and uh, FNA or core samples uh, can be obtained from the targeted solid component. Uh, and the literature does show that there is some evidence that uh, a combination of FNA and core biopsy for the workup of complex renal cysts is useful. Uh, in a series of 28 Bosniak III lesions, 39% of patients avoided unnecessary surgery following a benign diagnosis based on a combination of FNA and core biopsy. Uh, in a larger series of uh, nearly 200 Bosniak IIF and three renal cysts, a definitive diagnosis was found in 88% of cases, avoiding the need for surgery or invasive procedures in 70% of patients with an average follow-up of 5.6 years. Uh, however, with cystic lesions, there is a higher chance of sampling error since uh, cancer is often uh, focal and interspersed between uh, um, uh, benign cystic spaces. Uh, in addition, uh, there is a small but real risk of uh, spreading tumor cells locally due to uh, cystic rupture. And uh, given that uh, the Bosniak classification is usually adequate uh, on its own to make treatment decisions, the role of biopsy and cystic lesions is limited, which has been the view of many authors, including uh, Bosniak. Uh, in terms of post-biopsy care, there's no standardized monitoring uh, protocol. Uh, the pre-procedure and post-procedure uh, orders here at VGH are shown on this slide. Uh, consistent with what we discussed earlier, the pre-procedure orders are focused primarily on ruling out a coagulopathy, and uh, post-procedure, the uh, patient's uh, vitals are monitored every half an hour for the first two hours, and then hourly until the patient is fit for discharge. Uh, the patients are on bed rest for four hours. Uh, some centers recommend performing routine uh, ultrasound post-procedure to assess for uh, uh, the presence of hematoma using and uh, using Doppler as well to look for active bleeding. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, one of the major uh, traditional concerns about the routine use of uh, renal mass biopsy is the risk of complications, particularly the theoretical risk of tumor seeding and the risk of uh, bleeding given how frequently renal tumors are well vascularized. Uh, the most common complications are listed here and include bleeding, be it in the form of uh, perinephric hematoma or gross hematuria, infection, uh, AV fistula formation, and pneumothorax. Uh, but overall, the rates of complication are uh, very low. Uh, in a 2008 series of nearly 2,500 biopsies since 2001, uh, Lane reported significant complications as occurring in 0.3% of biopsies, with minor complications in less than 5%, and uh, no deaths. Uh, the table shown at the bottom of the slide here comes from uh, that 2012 European Urology Review, and uh, shows the results from nine recent series on renal mass biopsy, with a range of uh, significant complications, which were defined as requiring active treatment or admission to hospital, as occurring in 0 to 1.8% of biopsies. In terms of the risk of bleeding, although uh, small perirenal and subcapsular hematomas are frequently observed when uh, post-biopsy CT is obtained, uh, recent series have shown that clinically significant bleeding is unusual and uh, generally self-limited. Uh, from the same chart uh, shown on the previous slide, we see that uh, clinically significant bleeding, which was also defined as bleeding requiring active treatment or admission to hospital, is rare, occurring in a range of 0 to 1.3 percent of biopsies. Um, it seems intuitive that the risk of bleeding should be greater uh, with larger needles, but no study has uh, directly compared the complication rate of biopsies performed with needles of different sizes. Uh, similarly, the risk of bleeding uh, would seem to be influenced by the number of cores obtained, uh, by the tumor location, or by operator experience, 
but uh, no study has clearly defined the correlation between these factors and the rates of pulse biopsy bleeding and complications. Uh, the risk of tumor seeding along the track uh, uh, is exceedingly rare with uh, uh, men in that to eight uh, case reports in the literature, most of which were from uh, poorly differentiated upper tract urothelial carcinoma. And with uh, contemporary techniques, multiple biopsies can be obtained uh, through a coaxial guide or cannula to avoid contact with the surrounding tissues and thereby minimize the theoretical risk of seeding. Uh, the risk of clinically significant pneumothorax has been estimated at less than 1% and occurs even less frequently when a subcostal approach is used. Um, other complications such as AV fistula and infection are also rare. Uh, so given the relatively small risk of complications, this should be weighed against the uh, potential benefits of the clinical information gained on biopsy, which can potentially lead uh, to the avoidance of uh, under or over treatment. Uh, the next major concern which has traditionally limited the use of renal mass biopsy is the issue of false negatives and non-diagnostic biopsies with initial series demonstrating insufficient diagnostic yield and low negative predictive value. Uh, according to Lane's 2008 review and studies published uh, before 2001, the reported false negative rate for renal mass biopsy was up to 25% in some series. Uh, unfortunately, the rates of success and accuracy of uh, biopsies have not been reported in a consistent manner. Uh, without a standardized definition of failed, inadequate, and indeterminate biopsy. In fact, in uh, older series, many reported false negative biopsies actually showed normal parenchyma, blood, or necrotic tissue, which may in fact have represented uh, technical failures. So to find these terms uh, more clearly, uh, biopsy failure occurs when uh, insufficient tissue has not been obtained. And an indeterminate biopsy is when a definitive diagnosis cannot be made with the available tissue, and an inaccurate biopsy is a false negative or a false positive. Uh, taking a look at the numbers, uh, here's a table from that 2012 uh, review from the European uh, Urology Journal. Uh, I've blown up the uh, portion of the table looking at the diagnostic yield of renal uh, biopsies in a number of recent large series, which uh, ranges from 78 to 100%. Uh, also enlarged in the lower left-hand corner is the reported sensitivity and specificity of biopsies for the diagnosis of malignancy, which are 86 to 100 percent and 100 percent respectively. In the review by Lane et al. in 2008, looking at the results of nearly 2,500 mm -hmm. renal uh, biopsies, an overall positive predictive value of 97.5 percent was calculated, with an overall negative predictive value of 82 percent, uh, a sensitivity of 92 percent, and a specificity of 90 percent. Uh, looking closer at how the results have improved over time, uh, let's look at the study performed by Lane et al. in 2008 with reports on uh, biopsies stratified to pre and post-2001. Pre-2001, the reported technical failure rate was 8.9%, with a false negative rate of 4.4% and a false positive rate of 1.2% for an overall accuracy of 89%. Uh, post-2001, the diagnostic accuracy had increased to 94%, and the likelihood of an inaccurate or non-diagnostic sample was 5%. Uh, for comparison, the reported ranges of sensitivities for contrast CT is uh, 60 to 90%, with a range of specificities reported at 5 to 50%. Um, let's turn our attention now to some of the other uh, potential limitations of renal mass biopsy. Uh, limitations intrinsic to the procedure itself include uh, inconsistent uh, tumor sampling, and the sometimes challenging histology of renal tumors where difficult differential diagnoses of uh, tumor subtypes can be encountered. The evaluation of uh, Fermin grade can also be challenging, and there can be uh, intratumoral heterogeneity, meaning uh, the biopsy attained may not be representative of the entire tumor. Finally, another potential limitation is the interpretation of biopsy specimens where inter-observer variability with pathology may occur. In terms of histiologic subtype heterogeneity, uh, it does raise the possibility of inaccurately calling a tumor benign based on biopsy. Uh, fortunately, it's fairly rare, but with uh, oncocytoma, up to 18% have been shown to harbor areas of chromophobe RCC. Again, fortunately, the uh, oncologic outcomes of these uh, hybrid tumors have been shown to be uh, similar to that of pure oncocytoma. Uh, shown on the bottom of the slide is one of the biggest challenges faced on pathology which is uh, differentiating amongst oncocytoma, eosinophilic variants of chromophobe, 
RCC, papillary RCC, and uh, conventional RCC with granular cytoplasm, uh, especially in the presence of uh, limited pathologic material. Uh, overall, the diagnostic accuracy for tumor subtyping on core biopsies compared to uh, final nephrectomy specimens is high, ranging from 80 to, uh, 86 to 98 percent in recent series. Uh, finally, when it comes to uh, determining tumor subtype, it should be noted that uh, FNA is inferior to that of core. When it comes to firm and nuclear grading, uh, consistency between pre- and post-operative grading uh, can be improved when tumors are simply classified as low or high grade. But uh, further complicating things is that intratumoral grade heterogeneity has been reported in uh, 5 to 25 percent of tumors. Uh, but this, again, can be mitigated when uh, multiple biopsies uh, from different areas of the tumor are taken. Uh, overall, uh, firm nuclear grading for biopsies can be determined in uh, 76 to 94 percent of cases with accuracy rates of 63 to 76 percent. However, the uh, utility of determining firm grade on biopsy for its prognostic significance is less clear when it comes to non-clear cell uh, subtypes. Uh, in terms of what factors might predict uh, when a successful biopsy can be obtained, um, a few studies have looked at predictors for diagnostic success. Uh, large tumor size uh, significantly correlates with diagnostic yield, and the higher risk of biopsy failure with decreasing tumor size should be kept in mind. Uh, core biopsies are significantly less informative for the diagnosis of cystic lesions with higher risks of failure, false negative results, and potential uh, spreading from uh, cystic rupture. Uh, another predictor of success is tumor location. In uh, general, biopsies of anterior, upper pole, medial, perihilar, and endophytic tumors are the most difficult. Uh, patient body habitus is also a potential influence on diagnostic yield with uh, larger patients uh, posing greater difficulty. As mentioned earlier, uh, there seems to be no uh, significant differences in uh, yield between biopsies performing ultrasound or CT, although uh, CT is generally preferred for uh, more challenging cases. Uh, now I'd like to turn our attention to uh, the impact of management that uh, renal mass biopsy can have. Uh, specifically focusing on its role in active surveillance and surgical planning, as well as its use in ablative therapy and in uh, selecting appropriate targeted therapies in patients with metastatic disease. So to start, uh, let's look at what the literature shows the impact of renal mass biopsy and management to be in general. Uh, again, this table comes from the review in uh, European Neurology from 2012 that we looked at earlier. It shows that in recent series, uh, biopsy results were shown to change clinical management between surgery and alternative treatment options, including surveillance, percutaneous or lap-assisted tumor ablation, uh, radiation, or uh, systemic therapy in 24 to 69% of patients. This is relevant in the era of small renal masses, where uh, percutaneous biopsy can potentially decrease surgical indications for benign disease. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, small renal masses are benign in a significant proportion of cases, and the chances of benign pathology is uh, significantly increased with decreasing tumor size. I cited earlier a study looking at uh, nephrectomy specimens from 1970 to 2000 at the Mayo Clinic, uh, which showed that 30% of tumors less than 4 centimeters were benign, as well as that multicenter series from 2004 of over 700 uh, partial nephrectomies that showed 28% uh, were benign on final pathology. Uh, this, of course, raises the question of how many of these partial or radical nephrectomies uh, with their associated morbidity potentially could have been avoided had a biopsy shown benign disease preoperatively. Uh, in particular, renal mass biopsy is useful in the diagnosis of two relatively common benign tumors that can be difficult at times to diagnose with imaging alone, oncocytoma and lipid poor AMLs. Uh, we discussed the performance of imaging earlier, but to reemphasize a study by Remzi et al. Uh, in 2007, showed that only 17% of all uh, benign tumors were correctly identified on pre-op CT. Uh, in a number of other series on biopsies, including a Canadian series from 2008 by Volpe et al., 17% uh, of patients avoided surgery after benign pathology was identified on biopsy. And uh, this slide here uh, comes from that study by Volpe, um, uh, and it was on 100 consecutive uh, renal mass biopsies. Um, highlighted here in red are the 18 tumors that were identified as benign. Uh, of these 18 patients, all avoided surgery, with 17 going on to active surveillance and one undergoing RFA. Uh, however, we should keep in mind one of the limitations discussed previously 
And I said the uh, diagnosis of oncocytoma on pathology can be challenging, and there is a risk of undertreatment after the diagnosis of uh, oncocytoma uh, is made if it's harboring areas of uh, chromophobe RCC. Uh, furthermore, while observation may be reasonable for biopsy-proven oncocytoma and asymptomatic AMLs, uh, these masses will grow over time, and there is a risk for spontaneous hemorrhage with AMLs over 4 centimeters in size. Finally, in the setting of uh, multiple or bilateral renal masses, the histology of one tumor does not uh, necessarily predict the histologies of the other lesions, and therefore, um, if biopsy of one lesion is considered, biopsies of the other tumors uh, should be considered as well. Uh, let's turn our attention now to the role of renal mass biopsy in active surveillance. Um, with the idea that uh, surgical intervention may not offer a survival advantage in uh, elderly or high-risk patients, the uh, concept of active surveillance has become increasingly popular. Uh, the biggest increases in the diagnosis of small renal masses has been in patients in the eighth decade of life, um, which makes competing cause mortality due to comorbidities more common. Uh, for example, a population-based analysis of over 26,000 patients who were uh, surgically treated for localized kidney cancer between 1983 and 2002 showed that competing cause mortality increases with a decreasing patient age, irrespective of tumor size, reaching 28% for patients over 70. In a series of over 500 patients over the age of 75, managed with either surgery or observation for T1 tumors, Surgical treatment was not associated with a significant survival advantage compared to observation. Patient age and uh, a standardized measure of patient comorbidities were found to be the only predictors of overall survival. Uh, however, the concept of active surveillance with uh, periodic imaging and delayed intervention based on progression during follow-up uh, does pose some problems. Uh, recent studies have shown that growth rate alone does not predict malignancy. Uh, a series of small renal masses showing no growth during follow-up showed that 83% of those masses were malignant on biopsy. And a multicenter prospective Canadian trial from Jewett, published in 2011, showed that the growth rate of uh, benign and malignant tumors during active surveillance was not significantly different. Uh, I wanted to highlight the active surveillance protocol used in the study just mentioned by Jewett, where he looked at the progression patterns of uh, small renal masses. Uh, with this protocol, each patient undergoes an upfront biopsy for pathologic diagnosis. Biopsies are classified as successful if they are diagnostic of either uh, a benign or malignant tumor. Serial imaging is then performed with CT, MRI, or ultrasound at months three and six, and then every six months until three years out, and then annually. In the case of uh, pathologically confirmed benign tumors, uh, imaging is performed annually, which I've highlighted here. Uh, this has the obvious advantage of saving patients from excessive radiation exposure, as well as saving in costs. Um, tumor progression with this protocol is defined as growth greater than or equal to 4 centimeters uh, in diameter, a doubling of calculated renal mass volume in less than or equal to 12 months, or a metastasis with uh, growth greater than 4 centimeters, or doubling, uh, a, uh, rapid doubling acting as the trigger points for intervention. Uh, the protocol has not yet been validated, and given the absence of curative salvage therapy for uh, metastatic RCC, they don't recommend active surveillance for young and fit patients with their protocol. Uh, determining which patients may be best uh, suited to active surveillance and defining the optimal follow-up schedules for each patient may be aided by the pathology results on uh, biopsy. Uh, the firm integrating system is uh, known to be an independent prognostic factor for clear cell uh, RCC, for example. And although an independent prognostic role for uh, RCC subtype has not been clearly defined, multiple series have shown significantly different outcomes amongst different subtypes, uh, with clear cell tumors showing worse outcomes than papillary and chromophobe histologies. While conservative management may be recommended in elderly patients with significant comorbidities, biopsy may also show that it should not be recommended in patients with proven high-grade RCC. Uh, this is especially true in patients with tumors uh, greater than 3 centimeters in size. A study by Remzi et al. in 2008, reviewing uh, nearly 100 masses, 3 to 4 centimeters in size, size uh, showed that 25% were high grade, compared to only 5% of masses less than 3 centimeters in size. Uh, in young, healthy patients, uh, uh, biopsy for the purpose of active surveillance may not change management uh, because long term follow up has not yet been done uh, or shown to be safe. And, um, 
histologic transformation from low uh, to high grade or the development of sarcomatoid uh, differentiation may occur over time. Uh, moving from active surveillance now, uh, let's talk about um, how biopsy has the potential in, to uh, influence uh, treatment decisions in larger tumors greater than 4 centimeters in size. Uh, in these tumors where a partial nephrectomy is considered, biopsy may provide uh, important information on whether to pursue a more aggressive uh, or conservative treatment strategy. Uh, the decision to perform radical or nephron sparing surgery is obviously based uh, mostly on pre-op imaging and consideration of tumor location. But uh, biopsy can help with this decision, too. Uh, in cases where more technically challenging partial nephrectomies are presented, there's obviously a greater risk of complications, uh, for example, because of a size or an endophytic or higher location. Uh, in these situations, a radical nephrectomy might be favored when aggressive pathology is uh, present on biopsy, while a more uh, conservative, although more difficult, uh, partial might be attempted when the biopsy shows benign or less aggressive pathology. Uh, let's move on now to the role of biopsy with uh, ablative therapy. RFA and cryoablation are treatment options for uh, incidental cortical small renal masses in patients who are higher risk surgical candidates. Uh, Pretreatment biopsy is recommended for patients uh, being considered for RFA or cryo to obtain a histologic uh, diagnosis and to help identify the best candidates for these procedures. In a multi-centi series of uh, RFA from 2008, pre-procedure biopsy was found to have a diagnostic yield of 94%. And uh, here at VGH, patients undergoing ablative therapy do get a biopsy at the time of treatment. In terms of uh, post-ablation follow-up, however, the role of biopsy is less clear. The AUA recommends uh, consideration of biopsy following thermal ablation, particularly when uh, recurrence is suspected. Uh, typically, follow-up imaging is used to look for tumor shrinkage and loss of contrast enhancement on CT or MRI uh, to determine the efficacy of treatment. However, uh, differentiating between post-ablation granulation tissue and residual tumor is difficult and enhancement itself can be unreliable. Uh, in fact, in uh, one study, 46% of renal tumors with uh, post-ablation positive uh, biopsy demonstrated no enhancement on post-treatment CT or MRI. Uh, on this slide here, there's an enhancing renal tumor in the left kidney on image A, and uh, on image B, uh, the same kidney is shown six months post-RFA. You can see that it's uh, no longer enhancing. However, a biopsy of the renal bed uh, in this scenario did, rec uh, did demonstrate RCC. Um, this demonstrates how routine post-ablation biopsy may improve the ability to confirm uh, successful treatment. Let's look now at uh, how biopsy can support the selection of uh, targeted treatment for metastatic renal tumors. 20 to 30 percent of patients with RCC present with uh, METs, and 20 to, 20 to 30 percent will go on to develop METs uh, following surgery. As we mentioned, uh, renal mass biopsy in the setting of disseminated uh, metastases is a well-established indication to perform biopsy. And now, with the expanding arsenal of targeted therapies, the predictive information provided by uh, biopsy can be used to help guide therapy. Uh, in particular, biopsy is recommended when cytoreductive nephrectomy is not indicated or when uh, neoadjuvant uh, therapy is planned. Uh, one possible reason why biopsy could be useful when selecting a targeted therapy is that it can be uh, potentially used to assess for the presence of adverse uh, prognostic factors that may affect uh, treatment decisions. Uh, adverse prognostic factors such as sarcomatoid differenti differentiation indicate a limited response to systemic therapy and could influence the decision to perform a cytoreductive nephrectomy and avoid its associated morbidity. However, in a study of uh, 166 patients who underwent cytoreductive nephrectomy at MD Anderson, uh, pre-surgical biopsy results uh, were compared with final pathology. When uh, Furman grading was applied, full agreement uh, occurred in only 32% of cases, and this only improved to 68% uh, when grading was defined only as low or high grade. Furthermore, uh, only 12% of patients found to have sarcomatoid features on final pathology were identified preoperatively. Um, one limitation of this study was that some of the biopsies dated back to 1991 when outdated uh, techniques were used. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the results suggest that caution should be used uh, when considering information on Furman grade and sarcomatoid features when treating patients with metastatic disease. Uh, the determination of uh, RCC subtype from biopsy, however, is useful for uh, guiding systemic treatment of metastatic disease because in this area, we know that uh, RCC histologic subtypes respond differently to different targeted therapies. 
two randomized controlled trials have suggested that patients with clear cell RCC uh, may be more likely to benefit from adjuvant uh, immunotherapy following cytoreductive nephrectomy. Um, in a retrospective uh, multicenter review of patients with non clear cell RCC treated with uh, sunitinib and serafinib, the clinical responses to, uh, to both agents was low in papillary RCC, whereas data from, data from a separate RCT showed that mTOR inhibition with temsorolimus compared with interferon appeared, uh, appeared more effective in patients with papillary subtype. Uh, current research is also uh, focusing on the efficacy and safety of human monoclonal antibodies to hepatocyte growth factor, which is frequently mutated in papillary RCC. Um, also, there are ongoing uh, trials comparing neoadjuvant to adjuvant uh, sunitinib in patients with metastatic RCC, including the uh, SIRTIME trial, which is currently enrolling here at UBC. And if uh, neoadjuvant therapy is indicated based on this uh, emerging data, there could be an increased role for biopsy. Um, I'd like to finish things now uh, by discussing the growing interest in the use of biopsy to perform uh, immunohistochemical, molecular, and uh, genetic assessments that uh, can potentially improve our ability to determine renal tumor uh, biologic and clinical behavior. Um, ideally, the uh, diagnostic and prognostic informa uh, information provided by uh, tumor markers for RCC would be obtained with a non-invasive approach, uh, such as from serum or urine samples. However, uh, we're not there yet, as only a few promising reports about uh, potential markers in peripheral blood, such as uh, carbonic anhydrase 9, messenger RNA, vascular endothelial growth factor, and insulin-like growth factor 1 uh, are available, and the literature on urinary markers is minimal. Uh, fortunately, the data on the diagnostic and prognostic accuracy of tumor markers uh, from tissue is encouraging, um, although most of the evidence comes from studies performed on whole tumor specimens, not biopsy specimens. Um, however, the assessment of molecular and genetic markers on adequate biopsy specimens is possible and uh, can potentially provide important uh, information before treatment. For example, uh, we mentioned some of the challenges posed on the uh, pathologic analysis of biopsy specimens, uh, including potential errors in the differential diagnosis between RCC uh, subtypes, such as translocation RCC, oncocytoma, and epithelioidea ML. Uh, these errors can be minimized with the use of immunohistochemistry and chromosomal analysis on biopsy specimens. Uh, on this slide, uh, the immunohistochemistry panel shown um, uh, includes uh, seven markers and seems to be the most promising in uh, differentiating amongst these uh, subtypes. Uh, immunohistochemistry studies of uh, carbonic anhydrase 9 on its own have also uh, proven useful in uh, providing uh, prognostic information and uh, as decreased levels of this marker are independently associated with poor survival and advanced RCC. Another study demonstrating the use of molecular characterization of biopsy specimens to improve uh, diagnostic accuracy looked at core biopsies on 72 uh, renal tumors post-nephrectomy, where uh, PCR uh, on extracted RNA for a panel of four genes was performed. Uh, the addition of this molecular algorithm to standardized histology increased the overall accuracy for subtype diagnosis from 83% to 95% with sensitivity and negative predictive value for diagnosing clear cell RCC at 100%. Uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization analysis to evaluate specific chromosomal gains and losses have also been shown to improve the accuracy of renal mass biopsies compared to histology uh, alone. Uh, another study of biopsies taken post-nephrectomy showed that diagnostic accuracy for tumor subtype improved from 87% with histology alone to 94% with the addition of FISH. Uh, another study on FISH performed on percutaneous biopsies taken before tumor excision in 25 patients with indeterminate renal masses uh, demonstrated that the accuracy improved from 90.5% to 95.5% when FISH was combined with histology compared to histology alone. Uh, FISH analysis has also proven useful in differentiating chromophobe RCC from oncocytoma especially in uh, renal tumor biopsies when uh, there is limited tissue available for analysis. Uh, in addition to improving diagnostic accuracy, uh, molecular and genetic analysis on biopsy specimens 
uh, may be used to provide useful prognostic information to aid in the treatment decisions, uh, particularly for small renal masses in patients with limited life expectancy. Uh, several uh, molecular and genetic markers have been looked at as uh, potential prognosticators, uh, including von Hippel-Lindau, hypoxia-inducible factor, and VEGF. Uh, in the largest study, uh, 170 patients who underwent nephrectomy for localized uh, uh, RCC had 29 markers associated with the hypoxia-inducible factor and mTOR pathways assessed to investigate their uh, prognostic significance. Uh, and the expression of uh, the five markers that uh, are shown on the slide here um, were shown to be uh, independent uh, predictors of disease-free survival. Uh, a nomogram combining these molecular markers with uh, clinical and pathologic uh, data uh, yielded a prognostic accuracy of 90%. Uh, one particular cytogenetic alteration that uh, has shown to provide prognostic information is the loss of chromosome 9P. Uh, two independent studies showed that uh, 9P loss was found to correlate with a significantly worse five-year uh, cancer-specific survival and was confirmed as an independent outcome predictor on multivariate analysis. Uh, in the larger of the two studies, a nomogram was developed with uh, high prognostic accuracy to predict three-year cancer survival. Uh, which combined the loss of uh, chromosome 9P with TNM staging and Furman grading. Uh, finally, uh, core biopsies can produce specimens that are suitable for extraction and applica application of DNA and RNA uh, for genomic analyses. <coughs> uh, gene expression profiles from these uh, analyses have been developed to identify uh, histologic subtypes of RCC and predict clinical outcomes. Uh, Lane et al. recently identified a uh, 44 gene expression profile that was able to uh, distinguish two distinct groups of uh, clear cell RCC with different clinical behavior. Uh, in one group, five-year uh, recurrence-free survival was 68% com uh, percent compared to 42% uh, of the other. Uh, overall, the results of uh, studies on molecular and uh, genetic uh, tissue markers for RCC are promising but they are limited by small sample sizes and short follow-up. Uh, furthermore, most of the studies focus on the prognosis of clear cell RCC with less focus on um, other subtypes. Uh, further research is still needed, uh, but uh, molecular and genetic characterization based on biopsy specimens has the potential to improve uh, our prognostic accuracy as well as predict how tumors will respond to different treatments. Ultimately, this will help uh, with treatment uh, decision-making. All right, a lot to get through, but uh, to conclude, renal mass biopsy had historically uh, selective indications. Uh, with modern techniques, biopsy can be performed with low risk of complications and good diagnostic yield and accuracy. The increasing incidence in the diagnosis of incidental small renal masses, the development of conservative and minimally invasive treatment options for low risk RCC, and the uh, discovery of novel targeted treatments for metastatic disease have provided the rationale for expanding the indications of renal mass biopsy. Uh, updated indications for the use of renal mass biopsy uh, include its use in the diagnostic workup of renal tumors that are indeterminate on imaging and in the workup of incidentally detected suspicious small renal masses in high surgical risk patients to support treatment decisions and to avoid unnecessary surgery. Uh, when clinically indicated, biopsies should also be performed after thermal ablation of renal tumors to confirm histologic success and to monitor for recurrence. Finally, uh, biopsies of primary tumors are needed before starting systemic therapy for uh, metastatic RCC to select the best suited targeted therapy, uh, particularly when a cytoreductive nephrectomy is not indicated or a uh, new adjuvant uh, systemic therapy is planned. So that's it. Thanks very much. Uh, special thanks to Dr. So for helping me uh, put my slides together. Great.